hello friends, this is David Bose. Wonderful to see everybody today. Well, today I would like to talk a little bit more about the Garden of Eden. Um, many of you are probably thinking, well, that's kind of your favorite subject, David. And, you know, it is. It is because everything starts from the Garden of Eden. And as I have mentioned before in some of my other videos, um, all prophets, whoever were prophets, had to understand the vision. And they worked out from there. So all of the symbols of the prophets came from the very same source. All of those symbols came from the Garden of Eden. Moses wrote the first book of the Bible that we have today. And he's the one who wrote the first prophecy of Genesis 3.16. And so from there, all other prophecies extend. So we've got to understand the Bible and how it is spiritual. I mean, there are so many people today in the Christian religion, and that's what it is, friends. It's a Christian religion. But that's not what Jesus started when he was on the earth. When Jesus was here, Jesus, I don't know if you've done, you know, any research or, or um, um, searching out of the matter. But if you will do that, if you look it up, you'll discover. Uh, and you got to go back to the church fathers and see what they were talking about. And some of the ancient uh, groups of Christians that started. Remember, Catholics didn't start up till th after 300 years after Christ died. So that's when the, the Christian church began to take form. And then around, you know, 13, 14, 15, 1600, these Protestant groups started coming up. And they began to... Um, dissent on certain views and they have created the Protestant uh, religions of today. In the last 100, 200 years there's been some other groups like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Christian Science and they've kind of shaped our views a little bit you know further. But always remember that our view is shaped by our culture and what we, be, we believe is shaped by the common thread of what's going on in the world. I mean, you know, before these last groups, these, these modern American uh, religions came up in the last 100, 200 years, Protestants believed a little, you know, quite a bit differently, far more, you know, nearer the Catholic view. Um, but Protestantism has kept pushing Christianity further and further into different forms and shapes. There was a group that started taking Christianity in a more uh, esoteric way, like Christian science and some of these New Age groups. And then there were other groups like uh, Seventh-day Adventists that began to push the church more in a uh, a more literal and uh, back to the law. And, and we've got to go right back to the, to the actual Hebrew and, and it's got to be, you know, uh, with the Old Testament, it's no different than the New, and we're going back to the original. There's Today, we're kind of split in our psyche, because we, if we're searching for the truth, we've probably been reading. But remember, you've only been reading some of the modern religions. And if any of you have decided, oh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look into some of the early churches and the early arguments and discussions and find out what was really going on. Well, many of you don't make it very far. Once you start reading and you start getting confused. And our culture pulls you away from, from really learning because they try to make you believe that if you were to go back to the original, you know, ideas that were in some of the early churches before the Catholic Church came up, that would be apostasy. Because, friends, uh, many of the early churches were Gnostic. It's kind of funny because even uh, Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the law and they want to point back to, and like like Herbert Armstrong was a, a group who believed in the whole commandments and all the holy days and everything. And he wanted to get back to the original church and the Sunday was all from the devil. And so he began to teach this stuff. And yet him and the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses, many of them say, well, we trace our our roots all the way back, you know, Clear back to the apostles, and we can go through the Anabaptists, and we can go all the way back to the Cathars and the Albigensians and the Waldensians. But what they never really tell you, 
and what sort of gets lost in all of the translation is that these early Cathars, Albigensians and so forth, they were very Gnostic religions. Um, there were various different Gnostic religions and don't confuse Gnosticism with the early uh, Gospels written by Thomas and Philip, the Gospel of Truth. Those were very ancient, clear back to the days of the Apostles. Um, many have said they're Gnostic Gospels, but in reality they were simply many of the original Gospels that people who were Gnostic 200 years later preserved, uh, which Catholics you know, didn't like that view, and so they kind of weeded out scriptures and kind of, you know, only used scriptures that didn't sound Gnostic. Of course, there were books like the book of John, which got in, which discusses many Gnostic things, but what happened was they kind of translated it a little different so that it, because their views took on a less Gnostic view, they translated it differently because of their culture, because of what they believed, and that's what's happening today. When we read scripture, we're really missing out because we don't get to understand the correct translation. We're being led along by what our mom and dad taught us, what our culture teaches us. We're really missing out on what the original truth was. If you read in the book of Acts, you'll find that Jesus was called the Nazarene. There's a lot of um, confusion about this too. There's like one or two verses that say that Jesus was from the town of Nazareth. Um, well, if you look that up on Google, you'll find out that there are a few people who claim that there was a town of Nazareth, but the hardcore uh, research, the scholars that have done all the digging they can do have never found a place in Galilee named Nazareth. It didn't exist. But what we do know from reading church fathers and all of the historical information that we have, there was a community called the Nazarene community. And uh, it was just another name for the Essenes. Um, they were also called Ebionites. And the reason they had different names is some of them, uh, there were different communities. They were all basically the same um, thing. If you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of the Nagamandi Library and the ancient texts and the Church Fathers, you'll find that the Nazarene, and you can find this right there in the book of Acts, the Nazarenes were a sect of the Jews who believed in the Christ. And they uh, were originally, uh, they had John the Baptist was a member of them, was more or less their prophet. And after Jesus died, uh, well, of course, when, when John the Baptist died, he pointed to Jesus and they all followed Jesus. They began to believe in the Messiah. But at that time, of course, until things settled down I remember even when Paul was preaching there were all these different views there were those who were zealous for the law then there were those who were saying no we're not under the law and then if you read in the book of John first second third John Peter and those they're saying hey our beloved brother Paul he's cool he's teaching the truth but some of the things he's teaching is hard to be understood um, but there are some who are taking his teachings and saying we're not under any kind of law and we can commit any kind of incest or wickedness or immorality or fornication and and it's okay because we're not under law so they've tried to you know james uh, discussed the fact that yes well uh, paul's right you know we're saved by grace it's the law of liberty the royal law of love thy neighbor but he says we do actually have works and that is the works of helping your neighbor and clothing the the you know the homeless and feeding the hungry these are the works the new royal law of liberty has works it's the works of love and so they had to try and explain this and there was all this going on so now remember a lot of people say well look at james said we have to do this or james said this paul disagreed with james in the book of of the galatians well friends do you understand that james was not an apostle that's right he was just um he was the brother of the lord he was very well respected he was the um basically the bishop of the Jerusalem church. But if you'll read the book of Acts chapter 15, you'll see that James, though he was the uh, leader of the Jerusalem church and those Nazarene groups that Jesus, you know, Jesus had already died, so he wasn't the leader of it. 
Uh, but they were they knew Jesus, they believed in him as the Messiah, and they looked up to his brother, but they all recognized that Jesus had chosen Peter to be the um the one with the keys to the kingdom, the one that would make the decisions, that would lead the church. So they had a, a, a big sort of a council, a meeting there, and James said, well, what do we do? And they called upon Peter and Paul, and Peter and Paul gave their recommendations. And they explained to James, no, we're not supposed to keep the law. And it was a burden to our forefathers, and it's a burden to us. And our father's not going to put us upon this burden. And so, because Peter had the keys to the kingdom, Father gave him the vision and told him to take the gospel unto the Gentiles and they wouldn't be under the law. And Peter explained this to James. So the way it's come down to us in the book of Acts, it looks like James was actually in charge. But he's not in charge. He was simply in charge of the Nazarenes. But the Nazarenes are not the Christians. Paul went out and, and they were at that time trying to gather people. The Nazarenes was the community that Jesus came out of. He was called Jesus the Nazarene. But when he died... There were all kinds of questions. There were those who kept the law. There were those who were faithful for this and those who, who were studying the esoteric teachings. And all of these things are going around. Nobody knew what was going on. The authority was Peter and John and, and, Jan and another James, the Apostle James, who died right away. So the, uh, basically the weight of all of the you know, church fell upon Peter and John. And uh, Jesus, when he died indicated that John would continue and his writings would continue on down to the ends of time. And, and to this day, we have the book of John, for second and third John, the book of Revelation. We have John's teachings, but Peter's teachings are rare. We don't have much of what P Peter taught. And, and uh, Jesus explained to Peter that he would not be, he would die. He would be uh, martyred and his teachings would, would sort of fade away, but that he would preach again and feed the sheep that his teachings would come back in the latter days in order to give a witness and that's talked about in the last chapter of john and luke so you know you can see in the scriptures it's very very clearly that that christ gave the authority to peter that he knew that things would happen that there would be wolves that would enter in and there would be all kinds of controversy but um jesus himself um warned us of these things and he didn't put james in charge that's why james came to paul and says uh we hear that you're teaching uh this grace thing well i don't understand and um paul explained it to him so peter and paul got together and explained to him well this is what we're going to do and, and we're going to continue not to commit fornication but uh there's a lot of people who are zealous for the law we're not under it um this was our instructions and they sent them out to all the churches but there were a lot of esoteric teachings that were in the scriptures that you couldn't teach to people. Um, it, it, it's not that you couldn't just tell people the truth. It was, well, it's kind of similar today. If you tell, even here, where if I were to tell you some things that were true, some of you would be stumbled. Some of the things that we teach, we teach to those who are solid in the faith and they're ready for the meat as paul says there are those things that are that there are those christians that are only actually ready for the milk and so there are many things i cannot explain um in full detail on some of these videos i have to do this gradually and increment incrementally in a sense because so many of you aren't ready for the meat so what I'm trying to explain to you is that early church was uh, was not the Nazarenes, but that's where Jesus, before he started, before he died and, and uh, brought the new dispensation of his grace into the world, he had been a Nazarene, and um, otherwise called Essene. Uh, they were those who believed in a lot of washings and baptisms. That's why John the Baptist came baptizing. He was one of these Essenes. So... These Essenes, as I said before, very Gnostic, very um, esoteric. They were vegetarians. They were, um, well, you can do some research on your own, but um, it was very mystic religion. It was not, they didn't take the Old Testament literally. They took it very spiritually. And that's some of the stuff that I want to be able to teach in my videos 
but again I have to be very careful I can't just um, you know there there are some truths that can be revealed in, in a video such as this and there are some that things that you know are really only able to be given to those who are ready for that for that teaching so um, but those ancient religions that we've talked about in some of the other videos that I've made like Zoroastrianism and some of the Egyptian teachings that came down uh, with uh, Horus uh, we've been very confused about this and I will let you in on a little secret as I did in another video prior to this one uh, Joseph who was the um, son of Jacob went down into Egypt and became the high priest of the city of On otherwise known as Heliopolis and for centuries his children taught and was the high priest of Egypt all of this teaching about this Horus dying for three days and being resurrected born of a virgin having disciples was all prophecy that was written by Joseph in ancient times in Egypt and it speaks of the Lord Jesus just as if you look in the sky and you see the astrological charts and you see the virgin up there and you see the the Sun being born and all of the things that are written in the sky was all written by the prophets this isn't paganism friends same thing with Persia Daniel went into Babylon and began to uh, become the head of the Magi that's why the three Magi came and took off their crowns and bowed before the Lord and uh, acknowledged that he was the true king and uh, so what I'm trying to get at is that Zoroastrianism was like Judaism a religion was prophetic of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and it was very esoteric much of what was true in the first century we have lost today and it has gotten because of the Catholic apostasy it has gotten it's, it's actually been removed from our minds and our teachings the uh, Protestants did not reveal all this hidden knowledge because the time hadn't come but in 1945 1948 we, re we dug up some some ancient manuscripts and scrolls that uh, even today Christians are having a hard time with but if you will read those ver those ancient texts and Gospels you'll notice that uh, early Christianity was very very um, different than it is today let me give you an example of some of the things that Jesus taught uh, many of you might want to know was well, there such a thing as reincarnation well I'm not going to answer that question for you okay because um, I cannot go beyond what the scriptures tell us but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that the disciples had the same question they asked the Lord when they came upon a man who was born blind they said um, master rabbi was this man born blind because he sinned before he was born did he have another life where he sinned and now he's been reincarnated or there's another view that says that it was his parents that sinned it's some uh, genetic problem that he, he you know it was his father's sins and it's handed down from the original sin so the disciples asked this very specific question and Jesus did not say oh my goodness you awful heathen pagan people what is wrong with you you know there's no such thing as reincarnation that's just ridiculous he didn't say that what he said was no not in this particular case now you can take that for whatever you know it's worth but it's just a piece and I want to reveal that to you in this video that there's more stuff there if you'll dig deep to show you that what you thought about the early church wasn't what is true you've been misled so the disciples wanted to know and of course Jesus gave them an answer and he said not in this case but in this case this man was born blind so that the glory of God could be revealed now I believe if you look at that answer you'll see that whatever the answer is about um, why this man was born blind just as in other parables that Jesus gave this man represented all of us all men and the question is is why are we born in suffering and the answer 
in its short form is so the glory of God can be revealed, friends. Um, we're working out a beautiful, beautiful thing here on earth, and God's glory will be revealed. And if you stay tuned, you will learn what that glory is, and it will amaze you. It will definitely amaze you. When you find the truth, your heart will burst with joy, and tears will come down your face. Because the truth is greater than you've ever, ever known. Now I'm going to give you a couple of more things. Like I said, I want to go back to the Garden of Eden. Because deep buried in that parable of the Garden of Eden, which is a condition, the original condition of man, there are some very beautiful things. I'm going to cover only a couple of points here. One is that when God created man and put them in the garden, um, Adam named all the animals. Now, we've talked in some of the other videos about the animals and how, well, one of the animals we spoke of in one video was the serpent. Now, remember, it says that God created the serpent and he walked upright. Now, you know, don't try to read into that, that there used to be a serpent that walked around the earth with legs and, and arms. That's not what it's trying to tell you. What it's trying to tell you is that this very carnal, nasty creature that everybody's afraid of, and that's the serpent, he'll bite you. you got to be careful. He's carnivorous. He's, you know, he'll, he'll get you. He'll kill you. Now that's, that's a picture of something venomous, something bad. But the story's trying to tell you that it didn't always exist that way. When God created the world, the serpent wasn't poisonous, and he wasn't, he didn't slither on the ground, he wasn't nasty, and he didn't bite, but he fell. What it's telling you is the nature of our very world has been brought down into this ravenous, carnivorous nature. And what is this nature, this animal? What is it? Well, Eve listened to it and was deceived, and she was deceived by it. All right. I've tried to explain in some of my other videos that it represents the fallen, carnivorous, ravenous, wicked nature of the physical world that is deceiving us. The passions and the lower demonic forces. Remember, astrology is called zodiac. That is zoodiac. Zoo means animals. And if you look in the sky, you'll see all these animals, the lion and the bear and the lion and the, or the you know, different fish and different symbols up there. The sheep, the lamb. Of course, the lamb's that innocent nature. The lion is that royal nature. The bull, uh, Taurus, is that uh, nature of the beast that's, uh, could, you know, that you can master and put a bid on it and it will do your, your bidding. Um, this is all very symbolic of the nature, the astral nature that rules over the flesh. Astrology represents a kingdom or a, a rulership or a, a force, demonic forces. Now they're demonic. They're lower. They've fallen. Lucifer fell from heaven. He's that cherub. The cherub had the four heads, which is the four cardinal points of the astrological chart. And that astrological thing fell, and it represents the influences that influences us, that same serpent that Eve listened to and was deceived by. Um, but you have to understand, it was God who made the garden. God made manifestation in the physical form. God created the garden, the trees, and the animals. But when he did so, he made them in a, a spiritual sense. They were not a carnal, ravenous um, creation. Okay, but they, the creation had free will, and through pride, it fell. Because, you know, there's a lot, there's a teaching. This is, the, is going to be sort of the culmination of what I want to say today in this video. This is going to probably blow some of your minds, but... A lot of you believe that, you know, millions of years ago, perhaps, God created the angels. And then one day, you know, he had this 
this thought, wow, you know, I think I'll make the world. And so he made the physical earth. And in six days, he made, you know, all everything on the earth. And he made man. He made animals, actually, before man. And all these angels have been up there with God all this time. But you know, that's true. Okay. The Bible says, very first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not just the earth, but he created the heavens as well. And that includes everything. There's nothing outside, you know, in eschatology, in the Bible, there's nothing, you know, else beyond the heavens and the earth. The, the angels are in heaven. So what it's saying is that God created everything. And now I'm going to explain how he did it. And now he's, you know, the, the first chapter of Genesis is going to explain how he did it. Yeah, he's going to explain how he created the heavens and the angels and everything else. Well, Dave, it well, doesn't say anything about angels. Well, do you think angels existed before there was light? Before there was air? Before there were stars? Before... He, he, all, he, he's explaining how he created the entire universe. So where were the angels? Well, remember, all the demonic forces are represented by all those animals. When God created the animals, he put Adam in charge. He said, well, the animals were made on the fifth day and you know, man was made on the sixth day. But see, that's in the first chapter where he created man spiritually. But if you look at the second chapter, it says there wasn't any man on the earth yet. There wasn't any bush in the field. Nothing had yet become made manifest. And that's why in the Hebrew you've got that word that says, and he began to form the animals. And he began to form Adam from the dust of the ground. That's when the whole thing was brought into manifestation in a physical way. So yes, God made the physical world and it's a beautiful thing. And there's nothing to be ashamed about to live in the physical world. The spiritual and the physical must be inseparably joined for eternal joy. And they will both exist forever and ever. This notion that a lot of you have gotten from Buddhism and stuff that the, the physical world is an illusion, it's no good, and it's bad, and it's all you know from the devil. Uh, some of the ancient Gnostic religions that came two, three hundred years after Christ began to get off into that. And that's not true. God himself made and formed the garden. And he formed Adam from the ground. And he said it was good. But what happened was there, this entire creation, these demonic forces, these angels that fell, Lucifer, some of these animals that God created on the fifth and sixth day, they fell. That's the astrological zoology. That's the forces, the nature of the physical universe fell. And so that serpent began to be nasty and bite people. It's very symbolic because you see, this the Bible could have spent literally what pages and pages, thousands of hundreds of millions of pages describing to you the creation of the earth and the heavens and the angels and all the history of man, but it didn't do that because first of all, people two thousand years ago wouldn't have been able to understand any of that. We didn't have science like we do today, and um, it wasn't for man at that time to know those things. They were still eating meat. They were still very carnivorous and, 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 and wicked. And today, to this day, men have still all this lust and, and, and many of them and many of you don't want this knowledge. You, you're not ready for it. You're, you're only wanting the milk. And so this is the milk. Yeah, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. So remember now, Adam was the ruler over all the animals. Well, he was created on the sixth day. See, but the angels were actually made manifest in their various realms and degrees and animalistic natures. The birds represent those creatures that fly in the sky. That's the angelic spirits that, that fly into God's throne. They represent the angels. And Adam named them. And in order to name them, you have to know them. You have to get to know them, understand them. Remember, in the first chapter of Genesis, the animals were made on the fifth day and Adam was made on the sixth day. But in the second chapter, when they made, when God made the garden and made us and manifested us on the earth, 
it looks like God manifested Adam first, and then he manifested into physical form all of the natural forces and demonic, that now are demonic, and the angelic forces, those astrological forces that rule the, the, the like it says in Job, that the rule of the heavens, the, the hosts of heaven is what they're called, they were created spiritually in the fifth day, but they weren't brought into manifestation until after Adam was brought into manifestation. So it says God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and then he began to form the animals and bring them to him. So these uh, spiritual forces came and greeted Adam and said, okay, this is our ruler. Remember what God said to Adam. He says, I want you to have a subjection, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living thing. I want you to dominate all of these forces. Now, remember in the New Testament, it says we need to bring into subjection every thought and every passion, bringing into subjection to Christ. The Christ is that spiritual man that was created in the beginning. We're that creation, that new creation is going to be born in us, the hope of glory. And that Christ has dominion over all the animals. Now, Remember, if you'll, we, I think we've talked about this in other videos, the ocean represents the emotional part of the universe. The heavens represent the higher uh, place where thoughts are, are made, the spiritual realm. And the, the waters represent emotions. And when the wind blows upon the sea, it's the thoughts that blow upon the emotions. And, and, and the little boat against a rock with Jesus in the boat. The boat is our body, the physical world. And, and that Christ is in in that manger being born. And, and Christ wakes up and he calms the sea. The emotions are calmed. So the fish represent all these little emotions that are in this uh, lower realm. Actually, hell isn't in the earth, as most people believe. Even in Greek mythology, Tartarus and the abyss and so forth was under the ocean. Uh, you go to the earth and you go to the edge of the, of the ground. See, the mountains are high. You go down and down until you reach the ocean, and then deep in the ocean is the depths of hell. And at the very bottom, there's these caverns that was called, that's what the word hell means, a cavern. And so down in these depths of a subconscious is all of these inner deep passions and, and, and emotional things, such as uh, hate. And those are the things that got to be locked up inside that subconscious and never never to be brought out. Those are those demonic forces that are lower, that are the, that are the trapped in Tartarus, that are chained there, waiting for the day of judgment when they'll be let loose upon the world. And that frenzy of insanity that's about to occur. The earth is something that's stable. God's kingdom is on a mountain, which is uh, absolute truth. It's hardened physical earth that does not move. It's stable. Um, like we talked about, the trees are laws. Flowers and things like that. Vegetations, here today and gone tomorrow, Peter says. Those are ideas and, and you know, trifles and, you know, endeavors that, that are here and gone. But trees are more stationary. And the animals take refuge in those trees. Those animals are those, those uh, certain natures. And, and, Certain kingdoms take on these qualities, these animalistic natures. They may be, you know, now they've degraded. Our governments have become very uh, ravenous and, and, you know, carnivorous and, and, and they, they go to war and kill one another. But these original, the original nature of man, these animalistic natures, the nature of our passions in the flesh used to be in subjection to Christ. And so today... There's no way we can ever bring about the kingdom of God until we get a hold of the paradise and begin to bring it into subjection. Paradise is here, but it's only acquired through faith. You, my friend, all of you out there are the children of the living God. We are not little children under a tutor waiting for Christ because Christ has arrived and we've been given the keys to the kingdom. And what and you know, we can tell that mountain. To be moved, thrown into the sea, and it will obey us. 
We have that authority. We can tell that tree. Now that tree, you know, that fig tree, we can say be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will obey us too. What does that mean? That means that tree that doesn't need to be there, that's got these deep roots in us that, but, you know, Jesus said every tree that wasn't planted by my father, she's going to be uprooted. That's that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the laws of humans, the, the, the efforts of works, our concept. The trees are concept and perceptions. You know, Swedenborg talked about this, the perceptions of truth and, and goodness. Um, trees are certain things that begin to root in our soul and, and it's hard to get them out. But with faith, you can uproot these laws and conce concepts and perceptions. And you can rule this world and, and, and tame the animals and live in a paradise. The animals and the nature of your flesh can be tamed. You can rise above this, and we will as a mankind, but not until we understand the truth, friends. Not until we begin to accept through faith that we are the children of the living God and that it's our inner confidence in that, in, in that faith that God is good, that he's created the whole world for us, and we don't have to be afraid. You see, fear is that, that controlling spirit that causes us to have this law that judges one another. And we don't need that because God has created a beautiful world in peace. And so that serpent, he comes up inside of us and he tries to get us to believe that, you know, we're better than somebody else and that there's a law and that we've kept it and we're righteous. And these people are bad and they deserve to die. And, and, and so it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and the world just goes round and round and nobody ever wins. See, we're under a new law and a new covenant now. We're under that spirit of grace. We're under the um, authority of the new man that's going to be born. And that kingdom is about here, friends. And the veil is going to be rent from this earth. So you need to have your eyes open because when that veil comes off, you've got to be ready and willing to be able to receive it because. If you, when that day comes, and it's coming very shortly, when the veil is rent, if you can't accept the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time, then it will basically disintegrate you. Um, everything that cannot conform to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns will be instantly melted. Like the shaft, like the the weeds that will be uprooted and thrown into the fire. So friends, we've got to put on the armor of God, which is faith and truth and salvation. And we got to battle these demonic forces and put them down and have them in subjection. We've got to crucify the flesh and those five kings on five crosses, like it says in the book of Joshua. That's our flesh, our carnal flesh. And we've got to manifest the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So that we can live in harmony with all things. We got to take that physical world and all those astrological natures, and uh, well, like the the uh, the, the hundred forty four thousand. They're the ones who do it. And what does it say about them? It says they can play on a harp. They've mastered the song. Well, what is a harp? A harp is an instrument that has various frequencies and vibrations, and and there are ten strings. And I've talked about those ten, the number ten in other videos. The number ten is the physical uh, completion of the physical realm and they're able to master the song that physical they can play on it and harmonize it and and it says they're virgins what does it mean it doesn't mean that they have you know peter was one of these virgins but he had a wife it's not about being a physical virgin it's talking about what is it it's, it's the christ marries his bride the body the physical world is going to marry the spiritual. Okay, but you've got to be a chaste, waiting for that spiritual grace of God. If you're going to uh, commit fornication with the physical carnal world, then you're not a virgin. So that's what that's talking about. It's not talking about uh, people that actually don't have sex. They're the only ones that are going to make, you know, get into heaven. It's talking about people who are not any part of this wicked fallen world but we've saved ourselves for christ the spiritual union of heaven and earth so friends that's all i've got to say 
I hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, learned something from it and uh, was able to receive what I was telling you. Um, you guys have a wonderful week. This is David Vos signing out.